Hello everyone, I'm very happy to be here for presenting actually very shortly uh, in two presentations my chapter uh, which is within this uh, ESCAS project of uh, uh, Central Asian uh, studies, so to say. So, um, my name is Vincent Fournio, as it is uh, written here, by the way. I am a professor in uh, history of Central Asia in Paris uh, at the uh, School of Advanced Studies in Social Sciences in Paris where I have a chair uh, called Empires and Societies in Central Asia. I've been uh, working on this area and trying to understand it <laughs> since decades now, and uh, uh, I had the chance to make my first trips to the area during the last decade of the Soviet Union, of the Soviet times. It was, of course, extremely limited. It was even not a field work because we were, we were not allowed to do anything almost, but just to at least look at and, and see and feel a little bit the atmosphere. So uh, it was very still interesting to do that and to compare for me now, for example, with the, uh, what I see today in uh, Central Asia and contemporary Central Asia. I'm not working on contemporary issues. I'm a historian working mostly and teaching mostly on the modern period, uh, which is also uh, one of the topics or the time frame uh, of uh, my chapter for this project. And, but of course, uh, I go to contemporary Central Asia. I cannot myself as an historian go to the past. I would like to do that, but I cannot. And so um, it's interesting to, to see uh, obviously, uh, the, and to, uh, to try to make comparisons. Um, I've been many times in Central Asia, obviously, but the, my, longest, my longest stay was when I was the director of the French Institute in Central Asia, uh, in Tashkent, the French Institute of Central Asian Studies, sorry, uh, where I stayed there f four years. And I had the chance at the time to um, organize events in the five uh, republics of the ex-Soviet Central Asia, including Turkmenistan, which was not very easy and not every day, but uh, it was interesting to do so. So I'd like to start my uh, presentation dealing with a very important issue, which is the issue of, of how will I uh, write uh, if I'm writing my master thesis or my dissertation? How will I write, for example, the name of uh, the present day uh, uh, Kyrgyz president or president of Kyrgyzstan, Mr. Japarov? Or how will I write the name of the capital city of the Badakhshan, uh, Khorog, for example? With the name of uh, the president of Kyrgyzstan, I have a big problem with the sound J, Japarov. And with Khorog, I have this big problem with Kh. Uh, and with Badakhshan, Khorog being the capital of Badakhshan, I have two problems in only one word. And I actually, I have much more problems with this word because I have problems with the vo vowels too. But for the consonants, I have problems with the how I, what are the problems? How shall I? What kind of decisions shall I take or make to properly render the sounds J, Kh, and Sh, which is in Badakhshan, uh, whether I will write my dissertation or my master thesis in Italian, in French, in English, in Spanish, in Polish, or whatever. So, of course, the problem is um, here uh, immediately when you start to write, yes, but even when you start to read uh, the academic productions, because you read in many languages and you will also be confronted to that, to many, to a variety of spellings for the same names. Uh, when you are a historian, you also want to consult old sources. And uh, concerning Central Asia, there are sources uh, very valuable 
sources in at least seven languages for the modern period, for the late medieval and modern period. You have sources in Chinese, in Arabic, in Persian, in Armenian, in Russian, etc., etc. And so um, the problem is how, how can I uh, really, uh, um, which rule will I follow to properly render this sound which comes from one language or one spelling system or one writing system into another. Uh, Central Asia is a cultural area. There are many cultural areas in the world and uh, uh, of course the academic community is very well uh, acquainted with that kind of problems and uh, that uh, people who write and read faced since centuries. And so, of course, rules of transliterations have been made also by academic communities since, let's say, decades. And not centuries, but at least, at least decades. The problem is that uh, these rules of uh, transliteration are relative. They, they don't have an absolute value. And the slide you see here is just to show that we, of course, will we all uh, uh, will uh, consult such encyclopedias like the Encyclopedia of Islam or the very uh, the enormous Encyclopedia Iranica, which is so rich in um, articles and informations and analysis on Central Asia also, of course. And I put this example just to show that it's a little bit confusing uh, even for anybody, I mean, even for me, to see, just to see and, uh, okay, to admit that this encyclopedia will follow one transliteration rule and another will follow an another transliteration, transliteration rule. So the issue is very simple. We have to face that. We have to admit that. And we also have to take decisions for oneself. So the Encyclopedia of Islam, they decided this way, this rule, but they follow it, of course. And the uh, Encyclopedia Iranica, they uh, followed another rule. Of course, they probably have good reasons for, for doing that. And uh, they follow it coherently, of course. This is the only condition. It's to follow it co coherently. So it's an interesting, um, I would say, um, introductory remark to get into the diversity of the problematics that um, are contained under the expression uh, Central Asian Studies. Because Central Asian Studies, in a sense, are a quite uh, recent uh, area of studies. And uh, at least it is a very um, well-developed area of studies today since the crumbling of part of the Soviet Union in 1991. So, of course, they renewed entirely these Central Asian studies since 30 years. And in 30 years, of course, many, many new works have been published and many new ideas have been um, uh, developed. So now I'd like us to maybe come back, actually, because this is the first slide, if I'm right, come back to uh, the map that we have here. So the, let me read again uh, the title of my chapter. It's early modern interactions between pastoral nomadic and sedentary societies in the Central Asian culture complex. So as you see, uh, it is a very large topic and it covers a long period of time. It addresses many social and cultural processes and not specifically political events, for instance. Early modern here stands for the centuries of the late medieval ages and the modern period, what we call uh, modern period um, in French, for example, is not exactly what is called, um, what is meant in English, but let's say before the 19th century colonization time. 
Central Asian cultural complex here refers to the main components of the historical and cultural personality of the Central Asian area. And I would say if I would need for a better understanding of uh, what is uh, um, what is the topic of, of this chapter, I would rephrase it this way. After all, what is Central Asia made of? So that this was my task to try in a single chapter to put together some of the main traits or characteristics that uh, seem to me really important to put uh, in uh, this uh, essay. I choose nine key words for this chapter and I place them in uh, alphabetical order. I have so acculturation, Central Asian proper, circulation, cultural anthropology, culture of self, nomadism, periodization, sedentarity and uh, typologies. For this first recording, because we are doing now the first recording, I will comment four of them. Uh, nomadism, sedentarity, Central Asian proper and typologies. Let me uh, pass through a sh very short definition of what we can think about while we say Central Asia or Central Asian area for this historical chapter, of course, for this historical chapter, before uh, the contemporary map of five ex-Soviet independent countries. Um, firstly, it is, I think, tremendously important to remember that despite the fact that the term Central Asia itself dates back uh, the, um, uh, the colonial period because it dates back from the, 19, the beginning of the 19th century, what it refers to is a territorial body that arose as such in pre-colonial history of the area and was previously labeled with different specific terms by the peoples and the powers of Asia, of Asia around Central Asia. This means that the idea of a specific area different from the other large cultural areas surrounding it always existed in the view of, in the view, sorry, of the uh, Asian states or the Asian uh, peoples, the Asian states, particularly like in China, in India or in Persia. Indeed, the idea of the specificity of what we call now the Central Asian area always existed in the perception of the different states around. So we had the perception of a specific state, but without this uh, modern and European term, which is Central Asia. So the idea of the specific uh, um, uh, space, cultural and even political space was there, but under other terms. However, in the numerous publications since the 19th century, the term Central Asia is commonly applied to many different areas. And this is one of the big problems, I would say, when one starts to get into the field of Central Asian studies, to see these titles, these book titles, where there is Central Asia, but there will, that the book will concern only Xinjiang, or Central Asia, but the book will mostly concern Uzbekistan. It's very common, etc., etc. Even sometimes Tibet. You have almost 90% of the content of the book which will concern Tibet, but we still have Central Asia. Uh, that kind of publications were numerous in the 19th century than today. But still, still, we of course read them and we see them in the library catalogs. So it's quite confusing, and this is why I think it was. Uh, necessary to say that also as a part of the problematics of the Central Asian um, studies field. Uh, today, of course, this means since the crumbling apart of the Soviet Union since 1991, uh, we have a definition of Central Asia which is probably um, simpler and very often it's limited to the five ex-Soviet Central Asian republics and I'd like to 
still list their name, although I know that you know, it per you know them perfectly. So Kazakhstan in alphabetical order, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. For this historical chapter, I added to this core, let's say, of the idea of Central Asia, uh, I added also uh, the Xinjiang in China to the east and, uh, the, uh, north and, the, and the northern Afghanistan. And this is probably what we can see here in the map. So uh, here what you see in A, B, uh, D and uh, largely C, not all of C, but largely C is the ex-Soviet uh, Central Asian, the territory of the five ex-Soviet Central Asian republics. Here you see in E the Xinjiang, and here in C you see uh, the northern, the northernmost, uh, the western north westernmost part of Iran, and the northern part of Afghanistan, which I added under the notion of Central Asia to try to develop my arguments about, uh, of course, about uh, the, uh, the the assignments. I would say so the. The, the, what could be contented, contented by the, uh, under the title of my chapter. So, um, since we have this um, map, uh, I'd like to comment it a little bit better, and more in detail at least. So, as you see, we have A, sorry. As you see, we have A's, well, A, some A, B, C, um, D, and E. So here we have uh, put these uh, letters to uh, underline the subregions of which the central area is made of, is made. So A is, as you see, the Kazakh steppe, which is called in the historical sources Dashe Kipchak, which corresponds to the Kazakh steppe today. Dashe Kipchak is a little bit larger in terms of space than uh, present-day Kazakhstan, but this is also correct, of course, to put it, uh, to put this name on the Kazakh steppe. You see B here, which is the area of the Caspian Sea and Karakum deserts, <coughs> which is also um, kind of a natural and also political region, not only natural, but we have here the, we aimed here to under A, B, C, D, E, um, have a kind of a, a coalition between uh, geogra geography and cultural and political history. So these, these numbers or these letters, sorry, uh, would correspond to um, a coalition, uh, well, to uh, natural and or plus historical regions. C here is Khorasan and northern Afghanistan, um, and it even encompasses a bit of the uh, Iranian territory today, as you see. D is Transoxiana. So Transoxiana is not the biggest of the five sub-regions, but it's a major one, of course, and for, I believe, the reasons that you already know, but I will have the pleasure to uh, maybe develop some of the traits uh, for which uh, it's a very important region. And E here is the Xinjiang. We have a northern E and a southern E. It's not ju just for the commodity of the map, but it's also, uh, we have a sub-region which is under E, but uh, within E we definitely have uh, two uh, sub-sub-regions, if you allow me to say that. Uh, one is Jungaria, as you say, as you see on the north, and one is Altışak here in the south, which means in the various Turkic languages of the region, the six cities, and which is this conglomerate of oasis here on the westernmost part of China today, since Xinjiang is part of China today. So why to elaborate such regional delimitations? The main reason is because a single 
united political space encompassing the entire region, the entire region of Central Asia, never really came into being in this area, nor in the past, neither today. And by the way, uh, whenever the definition of Central Asia you will follow, anyway, this, on this body of land, you never had one polity, uh, you never had one, only one state uniting more or less uh, the bulk of the Central Asian subregions. In addition to that, the contemporary states of Central Asia were recently created at the beginning of the uh, 20th century by the Soviet administration. Overall, this is not that easy to grasp a historical argument to rely on and to define Central, Asian, Central Asia in the past. So today, it's quite easy to say I'm working on Central Asia. Why? Because I'm working on Uzbekistan. Even if you say I'm working on one mahalla of one area of the Dushanbe city, you can still say I'm working on Central Asia. But when you uh, work uh, in uh, historical uh, time, it's a little bit, um, um, well, you have kind of justify why you will uh, say I'm working on Central Asia since Central Asia never existed as a united single polity. Uh, since uh, it even at the 18th century, for example, did not exist as, an, as, a, as, a, as a term, um, since uh, European academics uh, created the, uh, this notion or this term, which is more of a notion, by the way, precisely because uh, there never existed a polity uh, in the beginning of the 19th century. So you, you really have to find ways to maybe justify yourself to use that term or that notion. Uh, and um, so the five above mentioned regions or subregions, to my mind, they are the essential components of the history of the Central Asian area throughout times. And due to them, uh, we can obtain a better delineation of the notion of Central Asia for the Middle Ages and for the uh, modern period. This is why I think it's really useful to have in mind that maybe th the um, integrated body of Central Asia does not really exist, but at least it exists through its components. And um, I think it's, it helps. It helps intellectually to grasp, to, to, to have a grasp on what we are talking about. Um, so let me pass to nomadism and sedentarity now. It's true that in my slides, if I am true, yes, this is, <laughs> this is okay. So it's true that I... Um, put a number one for nomadism and number two for sedentarity. But as you see uh, in my chapter, uh, in my chapter's title, these are two components of one reality, of one reality that uh, was uh, called in the title of the chapter, the Central Asian Culture Complex. So I would better will kind of um, treat them not exactly together, but really, uh, really uh, closely from uh, one, uh, really closely one and two are really in one, I would say, um, um, kind of uh, uh, one <laughs> explanation. So um, also I wanted to say, uh, taking the opportunity of having this slide on uh, the screen that Central Asia proper and typologies, which are the number three and number four, I will more kind of evoke them uh, than really uh, develop. I, for this, uh, for this um, uh, oral presentation, I purposely gave more room to nomadism and sedentarity. Just, um, just a, a word on this seal of the Kazakh, of the Kazakh Khan Abul Khair Khan, you see uh, the date of his reign. He was uh, a Khan of the Lesser Horde and he was geographically himself 
closer to the Russian Empire or to the Russian, uh, let's say, uh, already conquered territories. Um, what I like here, is, first it's uh, an illustration of the chapter. Uh, second, what I like here, it's, uh, it recalls us that uh, Kazakhs belong not only to the Central Asian sphere, uh, but they belong to the Central Asian spheres also through Islam. And um, it is an important point to make because the Islamization of the Kazakhs is per se a um, problematic issue. Uh, the periodization of this Islamization and then also which kind of social groups were already Islamicized where when some were not yet even in the maybe in the 18th century. So this is um, one of the good um, uh, I would say uh, source because uh, that was really the seal of Abul Khair Khan uh, source to um, um, make sure for ourselves two centuries later or more than yes the Islamic reference uh, by using uh, the Arabic characters for example uh, was really there in the mind at least of the elite groups of uh, the Kazakh territory. So um, pastoral nomadism and uh, sedentarity, sedentary agricultural or city life formed the two major economic models uh, in uh, Central Asia and so the two major ways of life in the region not only in past remote centuries but also until the first decades of the 19th of the 20th I'm sorry of the 20th century so they form what I call in this chapter the two poles of uh, Central Asian societies Nomadic and sedentary communities um, were the basis of this Central Asian culture complex. This is the reason, of course, why I put nomadism and uh, sedentarity among the key words. A word on geographic conditions, which is important. Nature in Central Asia is to be thought of in terms of interdependent relationships uh, established by human communities with their environment that they have profoundly transformed over time. This applies both to nomadic and to the sedentary agricultural areas. Central Asia as a whole is an arid region. It is, of course, major to remember that. So, uh, we see that, well, we can maybe foresee or guess this aridity here. We have a, 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 this is the city of Khiva here. And here we have a, a tent of nomads. Uh, of course, these are contemporary uh, pictures uh, with some grass. So this is spring or, or, uh, or summer and we still have some grass. Not everything is extremely dry, but uh, this grass doesn't, uh, is not here to make you thinking that it's not dry. We, ha we are in a dry environment, but of course there are um, different levels of drought in the region. So here also the two slides are to uh, illustrate the different levels of drought in the region. And here uh, we have this drought environment uh, where the sedentary populations live. So, overall, what is suggested here is that we have a very dry environment. So, um, throughout centuries and centuries, the Central Asian populations were divided between nomads and sedentary. And um, the question could be asked, by the way, why to give such attentions to such attention to the nomads and the nomadic way of life since first they do not exist anymore. I don't have the time to recall the dates of the last sedentarizations by sedentary and uh, uh, powers of the Soviet Union and China, but still uh, they do not exist anymore in the region, maybe a little bit in northern Afghanistan first. And second, uh, since this way of life is still perceived as a kind of primitive form of economy. So why? 
I think there is a very simple reason. Of course, the very simple reason is they existed, yes. But you can have also very small communities that existed. It's fully uh, enough to uh, uh, study them, but they may have not marked uh, that profoundly the entire history of the region. The nomads have marked profoundly the history of the region. Why? Just also because, let's recall that, they were scattered over all, probably 90% of the territory of the Central Asian space. Despite this tremendous spatial presence, they did not constitute, though, the majority of the region's population because their economic model could not sustain a high density of population. The average population is thought to be one, one inhabitant, one nomad inhabitant per kilometer, per kilometer square, per square kilometer, I'm sorry. And so, um, and so of course, uh, if they were dispersed over uh, or scattered over 90% of the territory of the Central Asian space or area, they probably uh, accounted for less than, we don't exactly know, but like, let's say 25% of its population and probably less. Nomadism is often called pastoral nomadism for Central Asia because it refers to an economy focused on raising animals and based on grazing animals. Central Asian nomads have raised animals since the Bronze Age and, depend on, uh, and depended on them for their living. Of course, there exist, there exist other types of nomadism in general in the typologies of nomadism, but not in Central Asia for historical times. The nomads have mastered all types of environment, from wooded steppe to uh, semi-desert and mountains. And um, I see that I probably have to um, have a quicker pace. So let's say that, or recall that, uh, pastoral nomadism in Central Asia is based on six animal species horse, camels, bovine cattle, sheep, and goats. And we have also a seventh species in the mountains with the yaks, which are the only domestic animal uh, able to face environments above the altitude levels of 4,000 meters. Obviously, not all nomadic groups kept or all six or seven species altogether, and the composition of the herds varied from one nomadic group to another according to the grazing resources, and this is what we quite see well here with those slides. This is why I, I put them. The pictures are not that tremendous, but see, we still we can see the Central Asian region is vast, is big, and so of course we have local uh, geographic conditions. One thing uh, maybe, um, yes, one thing very, very important, sorry, uh, I cannot skip this. Um, uh, the Central, Central Asia is continental and so it has very cold, cold or very cold winters. And this is the reason why uh, actually um, the evaporation is less overall in Central Asia than uh, in the classical tropical deserts of, let's say, Sahel or Sahara. And this is why, this is why uh, we have um, a much better uh, prospect uh, for pastoralism in Central Asia. And this does not concern only Central Asia, but it concerns also High Asia. So this is also one of the reasons why this famous Central Eurasia uh, or Central Asia plus High Asia, Mongolia, Manchuria and all that are really the, the, the domains of uh, pastoral, uh, pastoral nomadism per excellence uh, in not only in Asia but on Earth. 
So uh, sedentarity uh, is basically concentrated on small zones and it is entirely depending on, it depends entirely, sorry, on irrigation. Um, villages and cities are all oasis based since it depends on irrigation and um, they are located on a very typical ecological niche which are the foothills here i'd like to come back maybe to uh, the map just to see that we have this big region of Choresm. it is well known irrigated area on the left bank of the amudaria left bank just because the Amudaria goes to the north. Uh, right bank, sorry, no, what it is, left bank, yes. Left bank of the Amudaria. And um, the, with the city of Khiva uh, since the uh, middle of the modern period as a capital. Um, this is not typical, although we have a big oasis here in low lands, getting directly the irrigation water from a big uh, river, Amudaria, this is not typical of the irrigation and of the sedentary model uh, of in Central Asia. More typical are irrigation systems here all, way, all the way um, around smaller tributaries of uh, the big cities, the big uh, rivers, I'm sorry, like Amudaria, Siodaria or even Zerafshan, which is quite powerful. So this is um, interesting to see that you can have, you, you still can have that type of distribution, let's say, it's a very small oasis, but you still can have this type of distribution, though having a very powerful uh, economic and cultural sedentary life, which is not necessarily um, understandable and also something for us Europeans when we go to Uzbekistan today uh, from uh, Samarkand to Bukhara we are entirely located in the Zarafshan Valley and so we would say we would think oh, okay it's green it's green like, exactly like in uh, in Holland or in uh, in France no it's not it's absolutely not like that it's green because we are in a green corridor of irrigation but just you you quit the uh, corridor of irrigation, even in this, grid cor this green corridor of the, of the Zerashan, and you will have this uh, uh, natural environment drought. All right, I, it's time to get into the uh, point uh, third of uh, since nomadism and sedentarity were where together, uh, uh, as I said uh, in the beginning, Central Asia proper. So, of course, Central Asia proper, uh, this is uh, something that um, I think is interesting to think about. Uh, and, uh, of course, I will devote here only a few seconds to it. But it's more developed, of course, in my chapter. And I understand that these recordings are uh, very closely linked to the uh, chapter's readings of uh, our common project. And so this is why I thought it was reasonable to uh, have a more um, developed uh, argument about nomadism and sedentarity and a shorter one about central religion proper and typologies. In the central religion studies, uh, there is a very common confusion of space and scale between Eurasia, which I don't have on the map, but Eurasia would be, as you know, this Eurasian continent, maybe from Manchuria to, to Belarusia, let's say, or even more to the west, maybe. Um, so a confusion of space and scale between Eurasia, or at least this central part of Eurasia that is called now in this some Eurasian studies, Central Eurasia, which is a 
quite new expression, and Central Asia proper. proper. Central Asia is a specific part of the Eurasian continent, as well as of the dry zone with, which stretches throughout Eurasia. The problem is that, as I said, uh, we don't have uh, one policy Central Asia, one polity Central Asia uh, in the 18th century. We have a continental Central Asia, which is at the center of the biggest of the of the biggest continent, and we have so many uh, traits, cultural traits like Islam, uh, geographical traits like drought, which are shared by Central Asia, by one of or the five of my sub-regions, and the spaces around that I refuse to call Central Asia. So I have, of course, to have a method to do that. And um, as I said, my method, if I can say that, is to think along the lines of my five sub-regions. So, uh, the territory of the five sub-regions, this is Central Asia, and of course it shares many things in history with the Mongol history, with the Middle Eastern history and so on, but it undoubtedly has its specificity, its uh, historical specificity, without which, of course, I could not even dream of uh, uh, drawing or uh, enhancing or just, you know, uh, having these five sub-regions. So, um, it is very important not to, com not to make a confusion of scale, of dates, of, uh, you know, of space uh, between uh, what is called uh, Central Eurasia and what we have to consider strictly as Central Asia, uh, as, uh, Central Asia Pro proper, uh, which leads us to have the chance uh, when we write such chapters to really put Central Asia at the center. Uh, you know, uh, precisely because when one says uh, Central Asia proper, we can say, I'll say, we can immediately say, okay, so. I will really put Central Asia at the center and not this not really uh, defined zone where we have a, at the same time nomads, uh, Sunni Muslims, yurts, because Mongols also have yurts and live also in tents. So, you know, this is very important, I think, to, and since I cannot say for the 17th century, Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, they say that there. But we cannot say that here. So, uh, because I, as I told you, I taught in universities in Central Asia, mostly in Kazakhstan, but also, also in Uzbekistan. And of course, for them, it's very simple, you know, Kazakh history in the fifth century, uh, BC or even uh, whatever, AD. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a problem, of course. We understand this is a conventional expression and also it's totally untrue to say French history in the, in, the f in the 5th century BC. Okay, so this is a conventional expression, but um, it might be more of a problem, more problematic for some areas than for, for some others. So here we are, we put finally Central Asia at the center. The last point I wanted to make an allusion to uh, today is typologies. Uh, we really need uh, to create typologies or to face typologies or to amend and transform the existing typologies when one took, talks about Central Asia. Um, the problem for Central Asian studies is that many, and particularly for uh, uh, the study of uh, nomadism and sedentarity and the pre-contemporary periods is that many of the interpretative models in the historical and particularly anthropological sciences are in crisis. 
So, shall I say tribe? Okay, I might continue to say tribe, but I have to refer to the quite uh, old um, anthropological discussion since the 70s that um, really uh, fire completely destroy the notion of tribe, at least as it was constructed by the social anthropologists since the end of the 19th century. Kinship society, I was aware, I thought really sincerely that my three hordes of the Kazakhs were the illustration of a kinship society model. And many anthropologists would say no. And the problem is that with Central Asian studies, we have a big problem. It's not many of the theoretical, almost all, not many, all of the theoretical works in social sciences in the 20th century and even the beginning of the uh, 21st century uh, don't have a field work in Central Asia as the as a basis so the 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 theoreticians that we read and that we that we uh, that we take uh, so many from from uh, have their field works elsewhere in the world but never yet in Central Asia so of course it gives uh, it doesn't give uh, to uh, Central Asia the light it um, could have um, so the, the kinship society is criticized since also some decades, but more recently, like at the end of the uh, first decade of the 21st century, uh, an anthropologist specialist of uh, uh, Mongolia, so of the Mongols, so of uh, Central Eurasia or High Asia, David Smith, uh, published a very interesting uh, work on this question. So at least we kind of have for the first time a rapprochement, if I could say that in <laughs> French-English, between a theoretical work and our Central Eurasian, High Asian, Central Asian experiences, which is very refreshing, but still rare. So, um, to finish with the typologies, I would also say the strong uh, say a word on the strong link they have with ideologies. Of course, uh, uh, David Smith, for example, denounces very, very sharply uh, the construction of the kinship society as a, a purely intellectual model by the social anthropologist in the at the end of the 19th century. But we, this is okay, this is very interesting, but we have to be convinced ourselves that also Central Asians have thought and written a lot before uh, the colonial times. So we also can refer to works and, uh, and, and historical works also of the 16th or of the 17th century. And there too we find the uh, sedentary derogatory mentality about the nomads. Not only uh, m among the Westerners of the 19th century. And so uh, there is a very interesting uh, uh, um, um, parallel between this type of discourse that we have in Central Asia itself, but of course from behalf of the uh, of the uh, sedentary powers and uh, um, intellectuals or writers and the uh, European uh, preconceptions about, for example, uh, nomads. So um, this is something that I wanted to stress, the link between typologies and ideologies. Um, finally, for the conclusion, I'd like to, um, I'd like to, so Central Asian proper, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, put that uh, uh, 
uh, neither for typologies. This is my mistake. So maybe we can do that. And for the conclusion, I'd like to uh, stress the tension between mental mapping and geographic reality, which is extremely important for uh, Central Asia. Uh, you will understand very quickly because it's uh, really a very simple but important thing. The entire region features an extreme continental climate with mostly arid to semi-arid conditions. Drought is one of the dominant characteristics for all places where sedentary, I would say better, where nomads, but also where sedentary communities lived and live today also. But I am in the past, so I used the past sense. Therefore, the mental, the classic, our classic mental mapping of Central Asia, which opposes a nomadic north, which would be our A dash to Kipchak, A in the map, to an, agricult uh, an agricultural south, which would be Altishakh, if you remember, which was south of uh, E, uh, south of E here on the map. Uh, it will get only one second uh, here, Altishakh. Uh, to uh, plus, of course, uh, uh, Transoxiana and the left bank of the Amu Darya, so the, uh, the geographic south of Central Asia. So the classic mental mapping opposing a nomadic north to an agricultural, agricultural south is a reflection of the distribution of the material cultures, but absolutely not of the natural environments into which these cultures have developed. Bukhara's climate is even drier than that of the Dashte Kipchak, which is known for being the pastoral nomadic space per excellence. So this mental mapping um, uh, has to be revised entirely. And this is very interesting for you who will go, who already have gone or will go to Central Asia, uh, to see that this mental mapping, although completely wrong in terms of purely uh, environment, is uh, still repeated uh, in the local cultures. And uh, an Uzbek uh, living only 20 kilometers from the desert, but in a green city, will also repeat that, that we are in the southern agricultural um, uh, part of Central Asia. Yes, of course, agriculture in the south is in the south, that's for sure. But we cannot say, uh, like, for example, in Spain, you have this rainy, Ocean, uh, Atlantic, uh, Atlantic um, 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 coast of northern western Spain and this very dry Andalusia. No, we don't have that in Central Asia. Every, everywhere we have this drought which has been, um, which uh, that all communities faced, either in enhancing uh, pastoral nomadism or enhancing the, deriv the derivation of water as for to create irrigation system and oasis life. Thank you.